Welcome to San Francisco and to our session on Soil, Not Oil. Thank you to Miguel and his team, to the Soil, Not Oil Coalition, our panelists for their effort in preparing the soil of our conversation today for weeks and months, built on years of solidarity and action to heal the earth. And of course, to Vandana Shiva for her framing guidepost of thought in the Soil Not Oil book. In her words, the millions of organism, organisms in the soil are the source of its fertility. Uh, whether you are in this theater here today or joining us via live stream, you are the microorganisms and nutrients feeding the roots of this movement, the fertility of this collective movement. You are a vital and valued part of the ecosystem, and the success of its mission is made more possible with your participation in the awakening of this resilient, sustainable economy. I invite you today to let down the walls of your predefined thought and to be moved from the gravity of this moment to an opening of your mind to a collective vision of hope and urgency. If you are an investment professional, um, moment of housekeeping, and you wish to receive continuing education credits, they are available thanks to First Affirmative Financial Network. Um, my business partner, Alan, uh, is waving his hand back there. And if you are a CFP, find him so that you can sign in and get your continuing education credits. Okay. I open the door for each of you to take a moment and plant a seed of self-inquiry as we embark on this wheel of conversation together to imagine how you came to this place today. What does rising up for climate look like for you within your life work and purpose? What do these words mean to you? Power, freedom, ownership. The life work of myself and all of these panelists here today uh, lives within the realm of sustainable investments. So we bring a, a bit of that flavor to the conversation. And we hope there, there is a bit of something for everyone here, though. So uh, that's an important part of the message, is the oneness of, of this message. So thank you for joining us. And um, I ask you again to deepen your inquiry. How do you relate to investments? Do you see a resilient global economy? And can you embrace the soil more deeply within your work to elevate you professionally and to uh, sustain the planet at the same time? We have a lot to share with you today. And as uh, we begin, I want to acknowledge uh, the many who are not here with us today, the underbanked, those who are struggling without services, perhaps without food, um, we, we hold them and we honor them in our conversation, all, all too often forgotten in the world of investments. Uh, we seek to protect them and empower them, for we are one on this planet made of many organisms. Uh, we enhance resiliency by the democratizing of solutions within the investment industry, and we work toward common goals to expand accessibility and bring together this whole system in fresh new ways. Let's see if I can, here we go. Here we are. As Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we may have all come on different ships, but we are in the same boat now. My name is Sarah Green. I am a certified financial planner, as she mentioned, and I come from a long tradition of farming in the Midwest uh, and an academic of rigor around rural life and agroecology uh, education for youth. Uh, my great-great-grandfather was doing that um, generations ago. I'm honored here to be here and at this remarkable event, this remarkable moment. I'm not here to give investment advice. It's important that I tell you that. 
because it's what I do for a living and, and I can't do so unless we have a contract together. So um, I have a lot of thoughts and tools to share with you though and I welcome you to use them. And I hope you do. We've spent some time making them. So I've witnessed since 2015 an upward spiraling journey of aligned vision for a resilient economy um, building since the 193 countries came together and signed the Paris Climate Agreement. I've been reading and writing and organizing and witnessing and um, all throughout these unprecedented challenges. As we gather in the spiral here in San Francisco with the dawn of this Global Climate Action Summit, we acknowledge and celebrate our commonality together, this moment, this power. I offer you this graphic, I made this graphic, um, to talk about the theory of change and the business case uh, of public discourse for our community to dig in and rise up with a little bit more clear purpose that we are including this is the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals established in 2015 by the United Nations and all 193 countries above living soil, but yet under and held, protected under the tent uh, as well. So we need to widen the tent is, is what this graphic says to me. To reach our goals, we've got to widen the tent and we need to include the microorganisms. Uh, the earth is losing soil. I'm going to give a bit of context here and then pass it over to our panelists and I hope to briefly give this context so that we can set the stage uh, um, a bit better. The earth is losing soil as you above all know um, and climate change accelerates that loss. It could be gone in 50 years. Jeremy Grantham sets the stage for us well here by uh, adding an element of amplified effects of climate change on soil erosion. And um, you know, the simple answer is, is the nuanced answer is we need small diverse farms and forests and local economies and everyone in investing in them to cool the planet, increase food security. Um, so we're going to lean on the wisdom that we have here today to help us address this issue. Uh, after this brief introduction, I'm going to hand the shovel to Andy Bihar, uh, and he's going to dig in and harvest up some bounty on his work, finding common ground to protect the people and uh, find common ground with corporations as well for their shared interest, especially as it relates to food security and the power of shareholders and their ownership to have that voice. Tim Freundlich is here, um, and uh, he's here to share some really um, wonderful ways about he how he brings his framework together uh, to make things more, uh, foundations more accessible. And Theo is going to also show us the door for what's possible with her direct relationship, um, re direct relationship driven portfolio. What does it look like when it hits the ground? Um, so, uh, currently, this is the immensity of the moment. Currently, the, we don't have, uh, the cost of food doesn't include most of this stuff in it. Uh, the disappearing wetland, the soil loss, the water contamination. When you pay for food at the checkout counter, you're not paying for that. And we're here to, our panelists, push that further. Um, we have exceeded our planetary boundaries, the systems on life that su support um, life on Earth. Uh, Theo actually has another updated version of this that sh shows we've, we're pushing it even further, but as you can see, it's biodiversity loss is by far the uh, biggest one. And, and um, so the, if we embrace a, a wider cost of food, and we localize its production and benefit its ownership, that is how we grow a resilient economy. And our folks here um, are helping to do that. Um, from all over the world, we've got folks in the industry, you can see here a map. All of these folks have um, gotten together and uh, created some really wonderful tools. We've got these tools that are emerging that are fantastic and uh, they'll help show you the way. They are, you can be in the government, you can be a trustee of your fund, uh, you can be an asset owner, 
a fund manager, an impact investing company, and you can begin using these tools because these are all parts of the uh, ecosystem of sustainable investments. These are the 17 goals that you see across the top, and they are just beautifully flowing down into actual areas that we can dive in, investigate. Again, this comes from a tool that you can use yourself. These are folks in the um, investment field. There are lots of paths. I'm not even going to go into uh, the depth of this. The message of this is that there are a lot of different ways to get there in your portfolios and in your investment. You can positively put things in, negatively take things out, but are you system systematically evaluating how environment, social governance um, shows up in what you own? Investor engagement, I'm not going to run over that too quickly because that's uh, what Andy's going to talk about, and so we'll get more uh, in depth from him. A uh, big part of this context is there, there is a lot happening today, and this portion up here uh, is, what we, is sort of what we think about mainstream impact investing. So what I want to point out is that actually one in five dollars today is already invested in good. We're, you know, it's happening. It's happening from the top of the institutional investors where you see this body of um, investments that really aren't even accessible to, to most folks. They're happening at the institutional level, and there's this huge team of light, is what I want to call it. It's putting downward pressure in these democratizing solutions that you hear in the headlines. That's where it's coming more to the people. But there's a lot happening already. And some of it's happening in the private equity world. Um, Tim helps bring together some of those opportunities as well. Sustainable investing is not just for institutions. And we are much more resilient when all of the microorganisms within it have ownership and power and freedom to exercise it. Uh, last thing I'm going to say about um, portfolio development is that really to truly activate, if you are a por uh, professional or you're thinking about your own investments, I encourage you to think about not just public markets, but also the private markets. Not just companies that are traded on the exchanges, but uh, private companies that may not be as accessible. Look for those opportunities to get, because that's how you're really going to fully activate your portfolio. And if you are an investment professional, yes, you must consider the compliance angles of, of selling away. Uh, which is a, a real compliance issue if it's not something's not offered on your brokerage platform, uh, you can be held to that because it can be higher risk and lower return. So we must be doing due diligence. This is not to say we're not being mindful as investment professionals. We just have to ask and push further to incorporate. So I come back to this, that we have all come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. And uh, I'm looking to uh, look through this lens. I'm going to join the panelists over here from Warm, and I, I, I feel like it'll, it'll be more of a conversation. Um, so I want to turn to Andy first, and then I'll come and join and sit with you for a moment. With this theme of demanding accountability, for the harm that companies are creating. Can you share with us some of the work that you're doing around food safety and um, how companies relate to food safety and their consumer rights? Can you just get under the hood a little bit more about that as it relates to your work? Sure, thanks. Thanks very much, can everybody hear me? Um, thank you for that intro. So let me just give everybody a little background. Um, so I run an organization, a nonprofit. We're based in Oakland called As You Sow, S-O-W as in so shall ye reap. And um, we basically focus on corporate accountability. Our whole mission, and we've been around for 25 years, is about really looking at the power that corporations have. And um, the World Bank recently did a study, and they said, what are the hundred most powerful organizations on the planet. And, and of those, 69 of those are corporations. The rest are countries. So, you know, Walmart is sitting right between Spain and Canada in terms of gross national product. So th there's an awful lot of power. And when you can get a corporation to shift their policies and actually change 
what they do, what they do operationally, it can ripple through their whole supply chain. And so that's what we do. And a couple of examples, just so you kind of get a sense of it. Um, our, our theory of change really says that there's a lot of pressures on a corporation. There's grassroots, there's people who are being affected at the front lines. There's consumers who can decide they're not going to buy this product, they're going to buy this one. There's shareholders, and corporations are created to serve shareholders. That is basically their reason for being. There's also litigation. We use a lot of litigation techniques. And then there's policy. Companies generally follow the law, although not always. Um, and we find that sometimes policy uh, isn't really very effective because a company can just simply pay the fine. That's just part of their, just in their, um, you know, one of their lines of, oh, they're going to be, one of their costs. So we approach this as mostly as shareholders. So just an example of, um, uh, of one of the things that we've done. So one, one of our, and I'm talking about food systems, is the way that um, animals are treated, the way that food is raised, the way that, that, that chicken and pork and beef are raised, they're raised on these things called CAFOs, concentrated animal feed lots. And there's a lot of things going on there that are very problematic. First off, the animals, just in terms of just the animal rights, they're just packed together. You know, second of all, all of the manure coming out of there flows generally into rivers and then causes blooms. And so we said, how are we going to get after this? So what we decided to do was to um, talk to some of the big companies that buy poultry and talk to them about the fact that they're giving these chickens antibiotics in order to keep them so packed tightly together so they don't get sick. And what that did is, well, first of all, we talked to McDonald's and we got, um, took a couple of years uh, to get McDonald's to agree that this was a problem. Now we do that through filing a shareholder resolution. So every shareholder who owns $2,000 worth of a company for one year has the right to file a document with the company and say, I think this is a problem and I want you to have this voted on by all the other shareholders. So that's what we did. We wrote, a, wrote this thing called the shareholder resolution. It's 500 words. We filed it with the company. It's an official SEC filing. So now it goes into their public disclosures. And it's, it, it, and we also do a lot of media around it. We do a lot of press. So we're asking very interesting questions of the company. Your chicken has a lot of antibiotics in it. There's these things called superbugs that have become, uh, that, that are basically the antibiotics are no longer working. That there's a lot of, there's a public health issue. So McDonald's wasn't too happy about having that associated with their name and they decided we're gonna stop buying uh, chicken with antibiotics in it, which meant that we then could go and use that and we filed with Wendy's, with Burger King, with KFC. It took us about three years, but we got um, all of those companies to agree to buy uh, poultry that had no, no antibiotics, which changes the entire supply chain of the poultry industry because they're such massive buyers. We now have resolutions out with Sanderson Farms and a few others, but um, pretty much we can say that the, that the poultry industry is going, going to go through a transformation in the next few years. Now we're now talking to them about pork and beef. So our small organization, there's just 14 of us in Oakland, and actually our, our, we have a new, um, new manager of our environmental health program, is uh, Christy Spees is here today. Um, she just joined us a couple weeks ago. Is going to start working on this issue and also on other issues, um, including glyphosate. So glyphosate is the world's most used herbicide. It's Roundup, and you probably know it mostly from GMOs. But the actual, we, we wrote a report about this about a year ago. Um, you know, GMOs are plants that are engineered to resist Roundup so that you can plant your field of corn, plant your field of soy, and when the plants are yay high, you can spray it aerially, and it'll kill all the weeds, and then the corn can grow. Now, that's bad for the water systems, it's bad for all the adjacent communities, it's bad for the farm workers because this thing is a very, very toxic endocrine disruptor. But now they've started spraying it on wheat, it's a non-GMO crop, on oats and on beans, but they spray it right before it's, it's um, harvested, so maybe a week or two before it's harvested to what's called desiccate the crops. So it's gotten into our food system. There is about 17 times as much glyphosate in the U.S. flour as, 
as in Europe, because they don't, they don't allow it to be used. There was a recent study that showed that 93% of pregnant women had glyphosate in their system. And it's leading, they believe, to shorter pregnancies, to all kinds of problems. Um, it's also just been named as a carcinogen by the World Health Organization and by the state of California. So we're about to start a whole program around this, where we, we talked to Monsanto, which is now Bayer, um, and said, this just has to stop. We have to get this out of our food system. So how do you do that? Well, you create demand for farmers to change over the way that their, their farming system works. So if you create demand, so we're going to be talking to Kellogg's, we're going to be talking to Pepsi, we're going to be talking to General Mills and all the big companies to say, you're going to need to stop buying any grains that are raised in this way. Now, if they do that, there's suddenly there's no demand for anyone who's spraying. And that's how, that's how we believe you, you actually change the system. So I'm going to hand the mic over. But just in terms of what As You Sow does, we, uh, we really we, we come up with a strategy along the, these issues around, in particular, I've just talked about the food systems. We also work on climate change. And we've been filing resolutions with Exxon, Chevron, all those guys. We also just you know, file with all the utilities about coal. We work on human rights, on, um, on slavery and forced labor and supply chain. And then we also work on ocean plastics. And just, just a little note on ocean plastics, it's actually all very connected because we also work on hydraulic fracturing. So when you frack gas, you're going to be using lots of water, like 4 million gallons each well. You're also going to be getting this toxic, you're putting toxics down into, into the fracking hole. The wastewater comes up and it's got to be stored. So you're, you're hurting the waste, all the water systems are getting destroyed in fracking. The gas that comes out then goes to a plant called a cracker, an ethane cracker plant where they break the gas into ethane, methane, butane. Those are all the feedstocks for plastic. Then you get the plastic, and you're encouraged to throw away single-use plastic, and a lot of it goes into the ocean. So this is a way for the oil companies to create demand for their products, because people aren't buying oil that much anymore. Um, it's, the oil companies are, we're, we really, we just wrote a report, came out last Friday, where we see the oil companies as essentially non-viable entities, that they are borrowing money to for stock buybacks, they're borrowing money for dividends, that they actually have not been profitable for many, many years, and we believe it's going to continue that way. So um, this is a way of creating demand by destroying all of our ecosystems. So we believe shareholders need to stand up, unite, and, and, and make a major shift, because what you own is where the capital goes. Where the capital goes, that is what will grow. And if you know what you own, you can do something about it. And many people, how many people here have a 401k or have a mutual fund? Own a mutual fund? Does anybody have a 401k? Anybody know what a mutual fund? Most people do. Like 90% of people's investments go into these 401k plans. A mutual fund is just a basket of stocks. And most people do not have any idea what's in those stocks. And we, we've built a lot of tools now. So you can go to fossil free funds plug in any mutual fund and it'll tell you exactly what fossil fuel companies you own, what palm oil, what companies that are, are raising the rainforest. We also look at weapons if you care about nukes, cluster munitions, or landmines. And we are going to be coming out with one in November that'll show you the gender equality that these, each company in the fund you know, is, is doing. So there are now tools for the first time so you can actually know what you own. And if you can direct your capital, where you want it, you can actually create a world that is one that you want to live in. So I'm going to hand off the mic and uh, how did I do? Oh, 10 minutes. Look at that. Tools. Just so you know, Andy, Andy had two second, 2.12 seconds left without looking at the clock, so that's pretty awesome. Hi, I'm Tim. Um, nice to see everybody, except we can't see anything, of course, so um, there you go. Um, the, you know, I think this is a good progression, shocking you, that you put this together in this order, um, in that, you know, as Sarah said, there's, there's uh, a lot of opportunity to, to kind of operate at different altitudes. And um, 
and Andy's talking about, and what I find, you know, both one of the highest le leverage points and also the thing that is so frustrating from a personal kind of activist standpoint, which is big corporate America, and uh, and there is no doubt that that when you win on getting straws out of a system, and or more more importantly, out of the ocean with shareholder, you know, pressure and consumer pressure, you can, you know, radically alter the landscape that we're standing on. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, what we're seeing is, um, is especially in some of the more sort of progressive, more kind of social change oriented uh, front lines that people are really getting excited about, I think what you're gonna be talking about, so I'm, so I'm sandwiched in the middle here, um, of, of sort of the more private and direct uh, activity in small companies. And it's kind of what you were saying with, you know, this. The answer here is is in smallholder farms all over the world and localized intentionality and supply and, and circles of of sort of clarity around how we're treating each other and the, and the earth um, and so what we've been working at um, in particular is using uh, the the endowments that are trapped in philanthropy uh, or it's not trapped that have been uh, um, released into philanthropy and then are sitting there waiting to be given away to charities and uh, donor advised funds in particular in our case we have about half a billion dollars across a thousand or so families and corporations that have been put squirreled away and you maybe you've been reading some of these um, critical uh, things in the press around uh, those you know those donor advised funds people are just the money's not going to charity it's just sitting there and um, and so that was kind of our our big design principle is like you no know, that 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 philanthropic endowment base should not just sit there, it should be activated uh, and fully activated. And in fact, uh, in our case, um, full spectrum activated. It's, we want it to be giving away money, we want it to be in the public markets in, in um, environmental and social and governance screened ways, and, and we want it to be in small private companies and small hold farm uh, supply chains all over the world. And so what we've done is uh, create a, uh, a facility where we're basically moving um, endowment assets that are real investment assets into, um, into small investments all over the world. And we're doing those about one and a half a week at this point. Uh, we've done 350 um, of different structures of direct private debt and equity deals. So that's outside of the public um, stock and bond world that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and I think that uh, for folks that are really um, activated, uh, that that the the sort of endowment capital, and there's about, a, I mean, it's almost a trillion dollars of endowment capital in the United States. If you take the private foundations together with the donor advised funds, I mean, there's half a million donor advised fund accounts. And that's like Fidelity Charitable and the San Francisco Community Foundation and Impact Assets and, 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 and all over the country um, that add up to about a hundred of that, a hundred billion of that um, um, one trillion dollars. It's not quite a trillion. I'm, I'm rounding up because I'm feeling exuberant today. Um, it's okay. Uh, the uh, and but so basically, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing is that people that that kind of asset base, the stuff that's in our four hundred one ks is going to be highly regulated. It's going to be trapped um, in the public markets largely, in the, in the, in, and and it can do amazing stuff like put pressure on major corporates and uh, file shareholder resolutions and ding bad companies and rule out sectors to invest in. But, um, but the getting at those, those small hold farmers and making these you know, localized investments is a lot harder because your, your financial advisor at Morgan Stanley or JPMC or you, know, you should go and find a small localized, um, more socially responsible version um, of, of like a first affirmative financial network, for example. Um, that uh, you can you can really uh, get lost in in finding ways to get money directly into communities, and so um, I think that that is uh, a place where whether it's I mean this is a slide where these are just like a few of the deals that we've done in the last uh, few months. We're doing again about two a week, but uh, we're seeing we've done 36 sustainable ag. Uh, deals and sort of agritech deals that are what we believe fall into a sustainable um, rubric and a couple of the last that we've done one is a, a local uh, actually Oakland and they're down at the hub a few blocks from here so I think they're actually in San Francisco too but pasture map um, where we're tracking um, sort of uh, you know smallhold farmer 
uh, activity and, and sort of aggregating it up so that there's ac the people can um, can tap what they need to know as far as intel on their their cycles and um, and we've done uh, a bunch of small investments into that uh, that total ninety thousand dollars so we're not talking about like nine hundred thousand or nine million or nine hundred million we're talking about you know a, a relatively small amount of capital um, doing something that's uh, you know that's really unlocking smallhold farmer kind of ex excellent management practices and um, and then another one which is on uncommon cacao and but again we've done 36 of these in the last probably three years um, so that's you know one every was that one every month <laughs> on average I'm not sure if that's quite how it works it's probably more in clumps but um, the idea being that if you have um, localized interests in terms of soil and ag that you can actually put money directly into, into uh, whether it's a loan to a smallhold farmer group or, or, or a, a, a fair trade harvest finance cycle in the developing world on a commodity or, uh, or a cooperative uh, farmers who are, who are working in, um, in, in an emerging market or you're doing something like an, uh, an ag tech deal like a pasture map that there's all of these like inter interventions that are really really um, kind of you know cogent and uh, and where you can see and touch the the impact and the entrepreneurs and I think we're, I mean, you're going to talk about this um, but the the idea that you can actually do that and create facilities where communities of people can come together and aggregate into some of those deals it's real like we can do it just like we can stand up and say soil not oil and you know and vote our shares I mean I think we have to do it at all these different altitudes and um, and I think we need to demand it of the trapped philanthropic assets across the United States, those trillion or 882 billion or something, um, um, assets and, and say, look, if you're gonna be charitably intentioned, if you're gonna get your tax break, you need to move affirmatively in line with the future that we need to be investing in, all, of, all in, all of your assets across all, all, all asset classes, both the public markets and be more creative and, um, <laughs> We're looking at my screensaver, um, which are my very cute small children. Uh, that you know that we can we can really demand. I think um, maybe through shame and, and demonstration. In our case, we're you know we're not like prescriptive, but really show how how those hundreds of billions of dollars can be activated into direct investments and and also do no harm and and push the major corporates to do the do more of this and so that's you know that's kind of what we're seeing as the cutting edge of of philanthropy and endowment management. I think there's gonna be a lot more of that. And I think that it's possible with slow money and localized communities and, and investment circles um, uh, to really do that outside of philanthropy too, but it is challenging because of the deal structures and the, the kind of regulation is set up to, to make that quite difficult. So I'm gonna pass this over to Theo. Great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go up because I have to hold something. Up, so. is, this, is this on too? I just wanna make a point about that, Tim, because I think it's a really good one. Andy does a lot of work in the public market space of holding um, companies accountable, and you do an immense amount of work of creating, um, Tim, these glide paths for um, private opportunities to come to folks as well. So you've, that, those are the two sides of you know, that, that, that image of the heart with the tent on top and the soil below. You know, I envision that as the public markets, really the pressure coming from down and what you have some great tools on your site where you can actually pinpoint and see on the map where is your project? Is it in the global south? Is it in, in India? You, I mean, just these amazing tools to get into uh, the private space and see the rising up of that. So it's the connection of those two that I see as the full ecosystem of, of the investments um, for the good of, of people and planet. And Theo, I think that's a perfect time um, for for you, and is is there anything that we can do to make you more comfortable? You've got the. I've got the thing, and I need this. Oh, is there should be one more. One more what? <laughs> so greetings. I'm just so honored that we have the opportunity to offer our deep gratitude to the Ohlone people on whose land we stand. Um, 
Randy Hayes um, studied with the Hopi for a really long time, and then they kicked him out, and they said, it's time for you to go to work. So one of his most memorable concepts is there's no money on a dead planet. And he put himself to work for the Rainforest Action Network and has done a lot of wonderful things for all of us. Actually, in the end result, we all have time and choices. And that's really all we have. So if, if I really love people and I have the opportunity to have them somehow or other more enabled, more looking towards this fulfillment that they design for themselves, that's, that's my fulfillment. So what I'd like to do is share three phases of direct investment. And let me see where we are. Oh, there. OK, I'm there. All right. So first of all, it's really important to know what is capital? If you start talking about capital markets, capital is not only money, which comes under assets, but it's intelligence, education, experience, the ability to enroll, the ability to teach natural capital, and time. And we all have some of those. We keep thinking, why are you talking about investment? I don't have any money to invest. You do too. You have plenty of assets to invest. So this is my first portfolio. It's, uh, I, joined Slow, I joined the Social Investment Forum in 2004, but I joined Slow Money in 2008. And I realized that what was really missing in food farming and finance was infrastructure, local infrastructure. And so I only invest in local food farming and finance infrastructure. And I invest it in a very particular way. I invest it with my returns on investment being what I call, and I'm not wedded to this name, but being what I call community benefits return on investment. And the little logo says food and eaters, carbon in the ground, and resilience. And so those due diligence criteria are the ones that I use for my direct personal investments. And I'm thinking I've got to go talk to, to um, Tim, you know, I mean, this is not a big board thing. This is not an intermediary thing. When I've got trouble with one of my investments, I get the phone call. And I'm not advising it for everyone, believe me. Um, but the next activity, then you get feedback. You know, you teach people. You know, what do investors want from, from entrepreneurs? What do we want entrepreneurs want from investors? And then I started looking at different people. Communities are collections of people. And there are these amazing things that can happen in what's called public-private partnerships. That little, um, let me see, I think I have this thing here. How does it work? This is a, a how does the, oh, there. See, see this little community benefit direct offering? If you're a garden club and you want to, grow a farm or grow an enterprise. You can, you can do this. You can do this. You just have to write a, have a few bits of paper to do it. That's pretty good. This is an activity that I invested in, which is my first community benefit investment, my first community investment. Basically, Riverside has water uh, that comes out of the San Bernardino Mountains. It has power. It's a local power um, that network. It has land that's being donated by the um, public parks and recreations. They're donating 22 acres, 33 acres, 66 acres, an old golf course, you know, which is bigger piece of land. And so what they had was they had a buy, oops, sorry. They had a buy-in from, oops, I don't know what all this stuff is. Oops, that's, I went the wrong way, I'm sorry. There we go, I'm gonna try this again. They had a buy-in from absolutely everybody, every single person in each of these county, city, and regional entities had to buy into this project. And basically what happened was we got 22 farmer trainers, trainers to train, who are local, 
to train local farmers to grow the agricultural infrastructure. That's where we are now. They won, they won their regional development award because they, everybody thought they were so hot. And then I want to go into my third investment strategy. And these are, this is what Sarah was talking about as far as planetary boundary re resilience. We have a loss of now four systems. We have um, climate change, loss of biodiversity, integri biosphere integrity. Um, um, I can't, I don't know, there's something over the top of that other one. Altered biochemical cycles, phosphorus and nitrogen. So we have a lot of things that we have to pay attention to. These are just some research that I did before I made the big... Closer to my mouth, I will. Thank you. So these are just, you know, what you have to do when you look at communities. You know, you have to think about with the way we plan our communities impacts everything, and that's from the California 2007 climate change scoping plan. So I thought about, you know, the, the activity of investing locally and being the person on point for every infrastructure investment in, in, that I've invested in Northern California. I have 16 and they call. And I'm thinking about Tim and going like, Tim, maybe we can work together. <laughs> and then I'm thinking about Riverside, and, and that's great, but that takes 15 years. And I think that's great that it takes 15 years, but I think all of us have, have you know, faster timelines that we have to work on as well. And so I started thinking, what's really missing? And so one of the things that's really missing is access to land. Farmers have no access to land. It's all real estate priced. Ooh, they don't have um, a succession. So last June, Land for Good held the first national succession conference. It was amazing. You have to think systemically. This is a watershed. This is everything to do with farmers and farms. All these projects, all these jobs, all these careers are all in, that include food. Not only because they eat them, but because they know how to grow them. All our farmers who will be trained through the uh, local, trainer, uh, uh, tr local farmer training program will basically have the opportunity to grow into any food profession they wish. That's important because we, are, we do not have a lot of middle-income people. Farmers are often unlike the way that Thomas Jefferson and the members who wrote the Constitution held farmers because they were them, was they're not considered very important. But then again, three times a day, we need our farmers. We need our doctors when we're sick, and we need our lawyers when we're in bad trouble. But we need farmers all the time. The Pew Family Trust states in California that this is the median low and high incomes for uh, middle income people. These are, oops, excuse me. Oop. Oop. These are uh, agroecology students at a, pharma, a hydroponic system. So I have an, an offering. I finally came up with what it is. Today, I'm offering a new paradigm. Healing Living Systems is offering an opportunity for millennials to design and co-create a new economy and investors and investors to join us. These are in the back. If you're really sincerely interested in Living your values, O oh millennials, which are great for keeping things more liquid, which is fine. I know you have a heavy college debt, but you're so smart in the way that you spend your money. So if you're really interested in creating a legacy economy that can be continually updated going forward, this is a good piece of work. So Healing Living Systems and our allies are looking forward 
to having you fill out the Survey Monkey and show that you have the capacity to do this and you have the passion and the enthusiasm to do this. And for investors, believe me, Healing Living System, a California social purpose corporation, would love to have your help. Thank you. Um, so, speaking of tools, we have a couple more things that you, if you want tools after here, um, about, uh, we have prepared some for you. Uh, whether you are an investment professional or a community investor, uh, you're all valued. You could all take steps, hopefully, from this. Uh, Alan also has this. Uh, well, we can put some in the back as well. And then the big toolkit that I worked pretty hard on, I hope it's useful to some folks, um, is this guy. And it's, uh, I called it ESG Tools to Awaken. Let's dig in and rise up. There is an immense amount of data coming out in tools to help you connect the dots and see the dots to feel the power, whether you are a shareholder um, for a long time or just becoming one and realizing your freedom to exert your power as an owner, um, you are an important part of that. And we are going to be um, more able to rebuild the soil, to cool the climate, absorb the carbon, and increase food security if you're part of it. Um, I, I'm not sure, Catherine, if we have, I, I'm hoping we do have some time to take at least a, a question uh, from the audience. Yes? Oh, sure. The, and there are also uh, copies of this uh, in the back, um, and I'd be happy to pass along more. Um, if you, you know, I'll, leave, I'll leave this up for a moment uh, for you to take pictures or enjoy at your leisure. But any questions that come up, especially for our uh, amazing change maker pa panel here? Yes, please. So part of investing is disinvestment. So I'm um, wondering how people can know what is in their portfolios where uh, that they don't know that they're investing in nuclear weapons, uh, guns and ammunition, and in defense contractors. So uh, I'm with Code Pink, and we have a campaign right now, Divestment from the War Economy. And so we're interested in creating a local peace economy where people can invest, but the first step is disinvestment. So could you speak to that? Andy? <laughs> sure, yeah. we, we work closely with Code Pink, and thank you for the question. Yeah, the, uh, the weapon-free funds tool that we just, um, I was about to say launched, but I've, that's out of my vocabulary now. Um, we're not allowed to target anything or launch anything. Um, the the weapon-free funds tool that, that's just been, that just went live about a month ago, uh, if you go to weaponfreefunds.org and you type in any mutual fund that you might own in your 401k or you might just own a mutual fund, it'll tell you exactly what assault weapons you own, what nukes you own, or companies that make nukes, what cluster munitions, landmines, and also retailers of, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. We just did a, uh, we just did an analysis for the, the treasurer, the, the state of California, because the, the teachers in CalSTRS, so the big pension fund, you know, it's about a $150 billion pension fund, they wanted, the teachers wanted to get the weapons out of, their, um, out of their portfolio, and so we did an analysis for them, and we just did one for a group in New York for uh, the New York State Pension Fund and also the New York City Pension Fund. But it's all there, it's all just, just it's up there, it's free, um, and, you can see, you, you, if you, just, you can pick one mutual fund and it will be very high risk of having nukes and cluster munitions, and you can pick another one that has zero. Um, and there's many, and they're very, it's very easy to sort it, and you can just simply move your money from one to the other. It's, it's really that simple, so long as your company is offering you in your 401k plan a mutual fund that actually doesn't have any, any nukes, or doesn't ha is fossil free, or any of the above, and that's not generally the case. If you've got 
fidelity, if, if let's just say you have a 401k with 20 different fidelity funds, I can pretty much guarantee you they're all going to have fossil fuels in them. So you're going to have to talk to your 401k administrator, and we have a whole toolkit for how do you talk to your 401k administrator to try to get mutual funds offered to you that align with your values. That's the key, and it's, um, it's, it's an effort that's happening. There's um, eight and a half trillion dollars in 401k plans, and I can tell you from working with a lot of major companies. We're working with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's the 200 biggest companies in the world. One company has one mutual fund that is considered a socially responsible fund. So we have a long way to go. But I'll just to add to that really fast, you know, even I think it's really important to talk about 401ks because for a lot of folks, especially younger folks, it may be the only investable assets they have. Uh, at any scale. Um, I can speak myself. I'm not young anymore, but until not that re recently, um, it was, uh, that was certainly the case for me. And, um, you know, it's, uh, th there's ways to get that into, into small businesses all over, you know, all over the country. And, and if you are part of a small institution, there's a, like Social K um, is a great platform for small business, um, you know, for offering 401ks, they're fully socially responsibly screened and they plug in local financial advisors to advise and help in the process and give guidance to employees. So you don't, it, it, yes, if you work for Monsanto, you know, it's a big undertaking to get your 401k or bear, uh, you know, but if you work for your average, you know, small company and or nonprofit, you can do, you can do this. I'm going to take one more. And I would, I would also notice, note that on that first thing, the USF roadmap, yeah. also really great tools for that conversation. So also one more thing. If you, you know that your 401k is in the envelope, it's tax exempt. If you go to your 401k manager or another, you can take that money in its envelope and invest it in any of those small enterprises that Tim was talking about or that I'm talking about. In other words, I took my 401k in the envelope and invested in Wild and Radish in El Sobrante, right? So you can invest it anywhere you want. Well, there are lots of rules about that. Yeah, it's very uh, nuanced, um, and, and you've got to have good partners to get there and do it without getting slapped on the wrist. However, things are possible. I'm seeing a hand here. Do we have any questions for any more questions? Can I? like so much just like goes right over my head but like this is it's really exciting also because I just saw like recently um, a bunch of artists student artists young student artists that have no money in San Francisco you know get together and you know selling beer selling arts just asking for donations got three thousand dollars for um, for the border for people helping um, uh, immigrants on the border and so I'm just thinking about like okay what what could we do like getting people in collectives and investing like and bringing that back to communities bringing that back to collectives as opposed to just individuals because I think that like just from talking about economics and not studying economics just talking about it talking about like personal experiences with Millennials with young people we talk about decentralization. We talk about how it's not fair that our banks are taking, that banks are taking our money. We talk about like how to go through things without being, without being taxed, without being charged fees. Like the other day, like off a website, I used an electronic check as opposed to like a card so that they didn't have like MasterCard fees. Like there's just so many different things that are happening to kind of like decentralize and take give power, like, keep the money in the people's hands. I'm a designer of the millennial economy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that card for sure, and I'm going to take uh, a do, bunch, do you, do you and I'm going to share that. you know about transition communities? Have you looked up transition communities? They're, they're, I mean, they started in England, but they're based up in um, Sebastopol. You just, 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 I know we have a lot. Don't I'm going to look time. into that. But look into that, because literally small communities that are actually becoming resilient communities. It's called transition towns, but it's really starting to rely on your neighbors. It's about keeping the money in, in the local community, creating That's what's happening in the Basque country food as systems. Well. But it's starting at food systems, and then it grows into energy systems, education. And it's really, um, it's quite, and, and there's about 1,500 of them globally now. It's, cool. it's really spreading, and, and it's, 
and, cool. and it ends up, you get a local currency, you end up keeping about 80% of the money in the community as opposed to sending 80% out. You can actually invert that. So take, take a look at that. Very cool, but yeah. I'm sorry, like my, but my real, my real question is what you guys think of like Bitcoin and de 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 cent and um, Ethereum and like decentralized banks that are happening right now in turn I mean I don't know what, like what the role and in investment in that is but like in especially with like designing the new so millennial real, economy I mean, my, my, my rig like, is running is, but uh, no, like what can why don't you that role? let the other people behind you ha ask questions yeah, of course. and right. take those design issues into the millennial economy design and co-production uh, program okay. Yes, okay we have time for one one Quick, quick question, and I'm sorry for the other um, folks who are standing in line who won't get an opportunity. Um, so why don't we have them all ask, ask a quick question, then we can we'll just feel the ones that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll try to make it quick. Um, so I'm I'm a farmer. I've been farming for about three years. Um, I have uh, very little money and no real access to capital. Um, so I'm really interested in this question of land access that you brought up, Theo, and Tim. You might have some thoughts on this as well. Um, I notice, or it seems to me, I have the perception that a lot of the capital that's leveraged towards agriculture is more towards companies that are processing or collecting, like the cacao uh, collective that you were mentioning, or a uh, pasture map that are assisting farmers, as opposed to land-based businesses. And, and my understanding of that is that it's, there's a, um, it's such a different sort of investment than what's typically done. This much lower and much longer rate of return. So there isn't the same, it's a different mindset required to approach that and with much smaller profit margins. So I'm wondering kind of if, if you guys could go into detail and perhaps this is, we can talk afterwards, but about how exactly you go about leveraging, you know, significant amounts of capital to buy land in order to assist people tending that land and caring for it. Yeah, let's talk afterwards. Cool. Thank you, it's really inspiring what you've put together. I'm wondering, uh, it's still investment implies return on investment, and looking at where that uh, margin comes from, what's the state of the art, and I'm hoping you can point me to a URL, what's the state of the art as far as tracking the real value creation as opposed to what's extracted from the environment or from the workers or the future. So my question is not that different than the um, the one just before the one before around. Um, so I'm I work with a small nonprofit that does work with indigenous communities in Ecuador to seeking environmental and social reparations for the oil spills and contamination caused by Chevron. Um, and uh, we're very much struggling to find funding, and we. Um, and we're curious what kind of advice you guys might have for accessing some of these funders for projects that um, support community health, environmental justice, and um, uh, sustainable incomes for people. Well, um, I can, uh, for Fred and for the other farmer, I can talk to you about slow money investments. For this young lady, I think you're talking about significant partnerships with other attorneys that have already taken on and won some of the issues related to oil in Ecuador and, and Peru and what have you. And they have really significant reach and experience. And I, I would encourage you to connect with those attorneys who filed those suits. Yes, we we're, we we're actually have a collaboration with the organization that's suing Chevron. Um, we have a, a, a collaborative project that we're working on with them. Um, we're, yeah, right. We, we've reached out to some of the other nonprofits that are involved. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say on, the, on the, the farm and land front, I mean, we've been working with Iroquois Valley Farms um, recently, which is primarily working with millennial uh, next-gen farmers to secure land and to um, you know, create organic farmholds. And, and it's really about the land and acquisition and the, and the transfer and the onboarding of the next generation. So there are like 
professional scaling structures that we are able to put tens of millions of dollars into that are that are doing stuff but it's and they're and that they're a really excellent example for the farmers because they yeah because they are they're coming online with what's hard is to get at those private markets that have rules around how you get can get it into a an IRA or you know, a, a regular brokerage account they are making that happen much like you did in getting that, you know, small private investments when you were part of um, Cal Calvert Foundation. They're doing that with the with the farms. They're gonna. I can't talk too much about it. By the end of the year, you probably know more than I do. There's going to be a product for more people to access that. So I want to make one more comment about land, and that is that lots of people involved with food, particularly who aren't literally on, you know, working on the land every day, do not realize how important land is. In 2008, we lost almost all the assets in our community-based uh, land trusts. And so on the 27th of September, to another Slow Money investor and myself are hosting SILT, which is the, Su the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust, who's a land trust half an hour from Bayer Monsanto, who's aggregating hundreds of acres of land to be able to qualify farmers to grow organic food in the belly of the beast in soy and um, corn uh, monostructures. So there's, a, as I mentioned, there's a, very, there's a very active group of people, not many, who are really involved in growing land trusts. And I, I am one. So I, um, I'm going to end with this to ask you what lifts your heart and makes you rise for climate? How will the unknown depths of your microbial power rise up and nourish the soil for others to open the door for us all? so that we may all safely sail upon these rocking waters. Keep on digging, friends. Thank you. <laughs>